My name is Jennifer Flieger. I teach film at Rosinus College and I'm outside today in the rain to talk to you about First Cow, a movie that's set in Oregon, a place where it rains a lot, uh, in 1820. The film uh, came out last year. It's by Kelly Reichardt and it stars uh, John McGarrow, Toby, Ro uh, Toby Jones, Orion Lee, and a small part with Gary Farmer, who you may recognize from uh, Smoke Signals that we talked about a few Mondays ago, maybe lots of Mondays ago, um, and who also plays the part of nobody in Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man, another revisionist Western, which we can also count this, I think, among those categories. So the film is about friendship between two men, one man, one man named King Lu, who is in Oregon from China by way of London and various other places, and another man who is a Jewish baker who wants to open a hotel someday, who goes by Cookie, who has come to Oregon with a group of fur traders that don't really seem all that friendly. And they find each other in the forest and they form a bond and that's what the movie is about. But of course there's a cow because it's called First Cow. So there's also kind of a heist scheme going on with trying to get some milk um, from another character who is Chief Factor, who Kelly Reichardt calls the first CEO um, of this part of Oregon. Rather than thinking of him as a landowner, he's really the first capitalist and he's portrayed as rather foolish um, and yet things unravel as they do, as you'll see in the film. So there are three main ideas that I wanted to talk about with this film that might give you uh, some thoughts as you watch. The first of these has to do with the connection between Reichardt's vision of America and her film style. She has a very distinctive style that goes across her range of films. So Reichardt began making films in the mid-1990s, and for 10 years she was unable to get funding for her second feature largely because she's a woman and women directors often have this problem in the United States. So um, she finally did get her funding for a second feature and from then on she has mostly, not all, but primarily made feature films set in Oregon, even though she herself is from Miami. She has said she likes being able to make films that aren't her story. She likes being able to immerse herself in other time periods and places. And this is something that she does in this movie because it's set in 1820, so she did a lot of research in Oregon with historians and the crew that she regularly works with there. And there are just aren't as much materials on 1820 as there are for a film that she made later, Meek's Cutoff, that was set in 1845. So there had to be a lot more digging and research to be done for this one than was done previously. But I promise to talk about the style and her idea of America. So Reichardt makes movies primarily about drifters, people who are trying to get something but don't quite have the means to achieve what it is they want to achieve. And they're thwarted, usually by some kind of social construction, even as they're trying and often succeeding to live in the difficult landscapes around them. And the way that she portrays this is through largely an immobile camera in which we're immersed in a setting where the camera won't move so that we, like the drifters who are stuck in space, uh, feel the landscape around us and as if we have to work our way through it as well to become one with it in some way. And there's a point in this film, in First Cow, where she shifts that perspective a little bit. And it's when we enter Chief Factor's home. In the home, Reichardt's camera does a 360 degree pan that seems relatively unconnected from what the characters are actually talking about. Later, she will do a left and right tracking shot back and forth as Factor is sleeping and one of his servants is walking around the room. Again, not connected. It's almost as if her camera is restless in the house in a way that it isn't in the outdoors. And this is the way the characters themselves feel. And you feel this throughout her films, the way in which she's constructing a seer and a scene, um, a person who's looking at the characters and the characters themselves. A movie, another movie that she made where this happens that you might want to think about if you've seen it um, is Wendy and Lucy, starring Michelle Williams and Reichardt's own dog as Lucy. It's about a drifter and her relationship with a dog. And in that film at the very beginning, we hear somebody humming who's meant to be Michelle Williams, but it's behind the camera and we see Michelle Williams in front of the camera. So there's this relationship between something sort of split off from her subjectivity looking back at her. There's a sense of that that we get in First Cow as well. So you might want to think about how she's creating that vision for us. She relies largely on diegetic sound, the sounds of the world, to build up her soundscape rather than um, composed music. This, music does, or this movie does have music composed by William Tyler, 
and it's really beautiful and minimalist, much like Riker's images as well. Um, he uses a dulcimer, a harp, an electric guitar, at times a toy piano, for these very simple little melodies that he allows to define his character and the space around them. So you can listen for that and its relationship to um, the way that she's thinking about characters as drifting through spaces, unmoored and trying to connect to the natural landscape. Um, she also does her own editing. She says because it's cheaper, um, and she was unable to ever get enough funding that she wants for her films, but also she does something with her editing that's just incredible that you don't often see. And this, I would say, is that she lingers on characters after the scene is over. So we'll see this at one point in the film in Chief Factor's house where she lingers on a couple of women talking on a sofa, or she will linger on a couple of characters outside of a tavern of sorts. It's, it's hard to say what exactly this is in this old fort village, but um, these kinds of things where we can imagine an entire backstory for everybody around just by the simple gestures of their movements. So these are the connections between um, how her image of America and the drifter and the idea of a future is connected to her filming style. Second, you might think about her construction of character, which she is very careful to do through gestures. She trains her characters by thinking very often about the process or the chores, she, she says. What would the chores be that they would be doing? And it's through their chores that we can imagine their world and their thought process because her characters don't often tell us very much with the dialogue. So for this film, her character, her actors, went out into the Oregon wilderness with a reenactor who trained them in survivalist tactics for several days before they started shooting. So they learned things like how to build a fire without matches um, or lighter fluid, um, how to skin a squirrel, how to cook the oily cakes that we see them making in the film. And so it's important for her that the actors are really doing the actions that we see them doing because from these actions we can get closer to imagining what they would have been like in 1820, which is what she's trying to evoke with her camera. And um, on that vein, she has these certain scenes that will be able to imagine these characters in very well. So our introduction to Cookie, we will see him pulling flowers from the uh, branches in the woods, picking mushrooms, and then very gently in one moment turning over a lizard. And it's just in that gentle gesture of allowing this little lizard to crawl away that we get a wonderful sense of the kind of person he is before he's even said a thing. Um, there's also a little melody that accompanies him that gives us a sense of his innocence and of the kind of character that we imagine he's going to be when he finally does begin to talk and have a relationship with somebody else. There are other beautiful moments like this. My favorite moment in the film is when the two characters finally go to King Lou's little shack and we see King Lou outside chopping wood and Cookie just picks up a broom and begins to sweep. And it's that rhythmic relationship, it's not perfect rhythm, but between the wood chopping and the sound of the sweeping and the wiping of a, a fur, and then he goes out to pick some wild flowers. They don't say anything, but it's the way they fall into rhythm with one another that gives us a wonderful sense of the kind of friendship that they're going to have. So it's these simple gestures and chores that we see allow her to create characters that are really memorable and moments that are just absolutely beautiful. And finally, the third thing I wanted to talk about is Reichardt's revision of the mythology of the American West and the masculine hero therein. So she begins this film with a quote by Blake um, that I'll ask you to look for rather than recite for you now. And if you keep it in your mind as you're watching the film, and imagine this movie starring any of the Western heroes that you might know, John Wayne or Gary Cooper, it just wouldn't work at all because this is not the rugged individual American masculine uh, hero who goes against all moral codes to fight his own way with his own sense of justice and a, a need for two women to bounce off of, one pure and one uh, tainted in some way. This isn't what this movie is about at all. This is a very different vision of what if we built an America based on teamwork and cooperation and love instead of individuality and fighting and conquering. And that's what Reichardt is really asking us to think about um, in her vision of the West. How could it have been different? At least this is what I think about when I'm watching. So you might think about it in relation to other Westerns like these. Some other questions you might want to consider are, what might the cow symbolize? Uh, why do we begin in the present? We have a beautiful transition over a century into the past. Why does she do that? Um, 
that transition at all. Why do we begin in the present like we do? And you also might want to think about what other films Reichardt's style reminds you of, other than her own films, which are of course very distinctive. Um, for me, I think a lot about Agnes Varda and Vagabond when I watch Reichardt's work, uh, with the idea of the drifter character and the humanity and sympathy that we're giving to a person who um, may not be very much like us today. Um, you might also think about Ray's Apu trilogy and the reliance on natural sound and its connection with sometimes uh, non-diegetic scoring coming in. That might be something to think about too. So I look forward to talking about this movie with you on Monday and with Andrew as well, and we'll see you then. Bye.